jointly organized by URA, Marina Bay Sands, and the National Library Board as part of our efforts to promote architecture and urban design excellence. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Andrew Fossum, Deputy Director of Urban Planning and Design, URA, to give a short welcome address. Mr. Fossum, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the URA Centre. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Mr. Moshe Safdi to share on his inspirations behind the design of the Marina Bay Sands Integrated Resort. Mr. Safdi will also be talking about some of his other distinguished works. Moshe Safdi was born in Haifa, Israel, in 1938. He later moved to Canada with his family graduating from McGill University in 1961 with a degree in architecture. After apprenticing with Louis Kahn in Philadelphia, he returned to Montreal, where he achieved worldwide fame when his sensational Habitat for Libya was the showcase of the 1967 World Expo. In 1970, he returned to Israel, where he was actively involved in the rebuilding of Jerusalem being responsible for major segments of the restoration of the old city and the construction of the new centre linking the old and the new city. In 1978, following teaching spells at Yale, McGill and Ben-Gurion universities, Mr. Safdie moved to Boston, where he was director of the Urban Design Program at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. His practice, Moshe Safdie Associates, is still based in Boston, with branches in Jerusalem and Toronto. Over a period of 40 years, Moshe Safdi has created a legacy of distinguished architectural works, including the Quebec Museum of Civilization, the National Gallery of Canada, Vancouver Library Square, the United States Institution, the Institute of Peace Headquarters in Washington, D.C., the Kansas City Performing Arts Center and the Salt Lake City Public Library, to name just a few. If this wasn't enough, Moshe Safdie has also found town to write several acclaimed books, most notably Beyond Habitat, Jerusalem, the Future of the Past, and The City After the Automobile. Moshe Safdie has also been a recipient of numerous awards honorary degrees and civil honours, including the Companion Order of Canada and the Gold Medal of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Indeed, it is a measure of Moshe Safdie's contribution to the architectural field that a Google search of his name will give you over 120,000 hits. We are therefore indeed privileged that Moshe Safdie has taken time to spend with us this afternoon. Please put your hands together to give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're embarking on a great adventure. Every day we realize how great the adventure is. And uh, I wouldn't say we've been overwhelmed, but we've been intensely involved with the design of uh, Marina Bay Sands. Um, but I'd like to talk first about what I feel is a unique process that we are experiencing. I think uh, those of, of you who I can address as you in Singapore, probably take for granted a lot of the planning processes that have evolved in Singapore over the past decades. When you come from the outside and you're building on three continents and you're involved with large and complex projects, you realize how unique the process of Singapore is and how uh, focused it is on achieving the public realm and the public interest within a private enterprise executed projects. And it seems to me uh, important before I begin all of this is to reflect on the RFP that came out for this project 
uh, how articulate it was about urban design objectives, architectural objectives, the connection with the city, and the content of the project in terms of what it will bring both to tourism and to the citizens of Singapore. And I think, though it's not the role of our architects to say so, I would say how forward-looking for the government of Singapore and the URA to have fixed the price of the land and to say we will pick a project based on its qualities and amenities. Whereas almost every public authority I'm aware of will have said the highest bidder gets the job. And clearly, at that point, the issue of amenities would have to take second place. I've been asked to talk about certain themes in my work that might have led to this. Um, and just before I start with the images, I'd just like to touch on what I think the key issues are for this project, and which we have actually uh, evolved over the years. The first is to re recognize that Marina Bay Sands is not a building, it's an urban sector. You cannot think of an urban sector the way you think about a building. If you think about it as a building, you're, you're, you're destined to fail. Urban sectors have urban structure, and understanding what that urban structure uh, is the key to the success of a project. The other issue is that it is a mixed-use project, and we've become used to the term. But a mixed-use project basically says there are many different activities. Designed in a particular way, they, become, they can become destructive to each other. Designed in another way, they can become com complementary. And to me, the challenge of this project, with all its extraordinary mixed uses, is will the sum total the whole, the whole be greater than the individual parts? And that's true not just of the architecture, but it's true also of the program. Will the component parts, the hotel and the convention and the museum and the shopping and all that, coalesce to be something greater than the parts? Then there's many themes in our work that I think sort of clicked into what Singapore was after. Garden as metaphor, as a recurring theme. Uh, and finally, there's a, there's a question that came up in the RFP, not a question, but kind of a requirement. And it said, there is a promontory site, and there must be an iconic landmark building on this promontory site. And one of the questions I would like to pose to you, and I'll try and answer it in the course of my lecture, is what is the recipe for getting an iconic building? Uh, is there a recipe for an upcoming building? Um, so, let me see. So, let me begin, not yet with a project, but just like a little bit of background, and I'd like to talk a little bit about urban structure. Until the end of the 19th century, cities evolved to, uh, very slowly. And uh, this is back, uh, this is back in, uh, in England. It is the quintessential 19th century city. It has, uh, it has uh, fashion formed by the architecture. And this is pre-automobile, and we still take it for granted. What we tend to forget is that in the 20th century, there was a paradigm change. With the evolution of higher density, high-rise buildings, and the automobile, we had to rethink urban structure. This is the so-called ideal city of Hilversheimer of 1927. And it is, I think, informative to reflect that this was presented as an ideal. The repetition, uh, relentless repetition, was part of the concept of equality. Uh, and the concept that buildings are set apart, the Corbusier then reinterpreted that as the Ville Radieuse, uh, set apart, uh, will give us some kind of a new wonderful urbanism. But I think this cartoon in the New Yorker tells it all. We lost this, and we got this. And for decades, through the 20th century, one community after the other transfer, translated these diagrams into projects. And even Singapore had its share of interpreting these diagrams into the early urbanism uh, of the 60s and the 70s. Um, again, I'd like to emphasize the extraordinary scale change that we're living through. This is a picture I took in Beijing in 1973. Shanghai looked exactly the same. There wasn't a single high-rise tower in either cities in 1973, my own lifestyle. There were very few cars, as you see, mostly bicycles. I was back there two years ago, and 
Uh, you know what the story is and what there is there, hundreds and hundreds of towers, triple expressways running through the city. But the significant observation was that in 25 years, they repeated every mistake, even though this was rebuilding from almost scratch, every mistake that the West has done. And while in Singapore, for example, you were trying to plan for transportation, uh, open space, green space, etc., uh, this was these were not lessons experienced uh, in Shanghai. This is Sao Paulo. I traveled by helicopter for one hour, almost 45 minutes, with this scene of high-rise buildings replacing the historic fabric of, of houses. So that you can see uh, that the typology of the high-rise tower is yet to be understood as an urban building block. We know how to take low-rise buildings and create 